Hans van Tilburg is the Maritime Heritage Coordinator for the Pacific Islands region with NOAA. Hans has previously presented to EAH and two of those presentations can be viewed at EAH's YouTube channel Scottish Shipbuilding and Falls of Clyde and the fate of the shipwrecked USS Saginaw in 1870. His presentation at this meeting focuses on the history of diving. Hans has been a diver for over 50 years and in this meeting, he covers his experiences which range from sports scuba diving to commercial and scientific diving including manned submersibles and remotely operated vehicles. He covers the earliest diving using just rock weights in the ancient world to the latest in closed circuit rebreather diving. He covers the simplest earliest diving that used inverted wooden wine barrels, the first diving bells, hard suits, and diving from saturation chambers. Email a comment at yehawaii at gmail.com or attend a meeting in person or via Zoom. Mahalo. It is my pleasure to welcome Hans van Tilburg back to the engineers and architects of Hawaii. I have sung his praises several times now as he has talked to us of sailing ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. Today, <clears throat> just let me say that as an eight-year-old boy, he first went to sea with his father and since then has risen to the top of his profession as a diver and marine historian. His title says it all. Let me read it. Hans K. Van Tilburg, PhD, Marine Heritage Coordinator, Pacific Island Region, National Ocean, Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, like, like in the Ark, <laughs> Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, did I get it? No, I already said yes. And a member, International Committee on Underwater Cultural Heritage, which I think is his tie with UNESCO and, and consulting to the United Nations. And there is more. I have heard, in fact, a rumor that he plays electric guitar for Noah's own rock band, the Two by Twos. I don't know if that's true, but as Andy Bumatai would say, uh, no quote me, I could be wrong. <laughs> today's, pres today's presentation, we will learn about underwater diving. And you might think that it, it was a logical path from the pearl divers of the Arabian Nights to the brave and courageous explorers that descended to the bottom of the Challenger Deep. But I think Hans is going to show us that it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Hans the Man from Tilburg. Ah, thank you. Sheer okay. poetry. This presentation is really quite informal. It's more a matter of, you know, personal rem remembrances and notes and my own biases, of course. I'm not here representing Noah or speaking for Noah on what, what we do as divers, but I will cover some of that. I was, a, for a while, I was a sport diving instructor. And so I did some of that, and for a while, for a long while, I was an academic science diving instructor. And for a little while, I was a commercial diver in the Gulf of Mexico. So I can't really speak so much to the, the, the military history of diving, military diving, uh, but I can speak to a few other things. Can you pull that first slide back up? That's actually going to be a picture of my birthday cake, which I don't remember at all. Uh, there are only four candles on it, but it has the dog. That's, my sister and I shared a cake because, you know, we were, our birthdays were close, and that's mine on the left. So I, I don't recall I had any proclivities back then, but apparently I did. Like Mac told you, you know, I did have a history of sailing with my dad, and I just have to say that, you know, it's embarrassing to show you the, the humiliation and, and indignity of this slide. How can an eight-year-old kid look cool being forced to wear a life preserver? And here I am holding onto the shroud saying, I know how to swim. You know, I know how to swim better than these guys. Why do I have to anyway? Let's let's go on. Let's leave the humiliation and indignity aside and talk about diving. I have to mention that that some of these drawings come from a, a wonderful work by Torrance Parker in 1997 called 20,000 Jobs Under the Sea: A History of Diving and Underwater Engineering." And also that this is a strange industry, a strange field, because you know, like like other 
pursuits, commercial fishing, etc. There's not a lot that translates into public awareness. There are not a lot of histories of diving. There isn't a comprehensive history of the development of scuba diving or recreational diving. There have been a few attempts here and there, so it really is strange that it hasn't been done, but Torrance Parker did that for commercial diving, uh, and it's a wonderful book. And it, you don't need me to remind you that, you know, jumping into the ocean for one reason or another, for resource gathering, for recovering lost objects, probably goes back time immemorial. Tie a rope around your waist, jump on it. In the ancient world, there were divers involved, free diving, breath hold diving, recovering, salvaging, uh, maybe some military aspects uh, of things on near the beaches. There's kind of a fanciful depiction of Alexander the Great in fourth century BC, descending under the water in some kind of domed L-shaped thing. I don't know that that happened or not, but it doesn't take too much ingenuity for someone to realize you turn a cup upside down and put it in the ocean and there's an air bubble in there. But what's interesting to me as a historian is if you look at Rhodian Sea Law from the Mediterranean, which is where we get a lot of our admiralty law actually, passed down in law of salvage and law of fines, those things have their roots deep in the ancient world, had rules for paying commercial divers, salvage divers as well. Now, I don't know that this is accurate, but the version I read is the divers could claim one-tenth of the good goods for recovery at three feet. I mean, three feet, come on. That's not very <laughs> deep. <laughs> you know, I figure anyone could go in and do that. 24 feet, you're holding your breath and going down to 24 feet, you're claiming half the good. So at least there was some sort of pay scale, and that's fascinating, for salvage divers. And something that a lot of people point at are these kind of Renaissance devices. Leonardo da Vinci drew, made drawings of some of them, of what are clearly attempts to design underwater breathing apparatus, surface supplied, somehow bringing air, maybe by bellows, forced down to a diver with some sort of helmet on his head, 16th century. What's interesting to note about these things, and we're not sure that they were ever tested, I mean, if you don't have a one-way check valve in this system, you know, you put this underwater and then the water's just gonna go right up the tube, so. What's interesting to note though, that even Da Vinci in his notes said that he didn't endorse these because it's the 16th century. This is the age of the surface Navy, galleons, frigates, and things like this, devices like this, that are surreptitious, that are hidden, that threaten the dominance of the ships of the line, along with, you know, floating mines, things like that, they were seen as really infernal, devious devices that would threaten the status quo of the powerful maritime nations. And it probably shouldn't even be pursued for those reasons. Nefarious use, interesting. Era of the diving bell though, like, you know, we understand that going back to 100 BC, turn the barrel upside down, sink it underwater, hold your breath from the barrel, 1500 to 1800, that is quite a span. And here we see on the left, an idea of what, you know, 16th century diving bells would have looked like. Wooden bells um, descending on weights and even weighted barrels that could be lowered and then have a tube going into the diving bell and then you open the, the valve and the air whoop, blows from the barrel into the diving bell and refreshes the air in the bell. And the, and the McCann diving chamber, which is the exact same concept. Of course, the modern version invented in 1926 by Swede Momsen. I think Charles Momsen is it? Swede Momsen uh, in the Navy. There were several, in the 20s, there were several really terrible naval accidents. Uh, the F-4, I think it was the F-21, uh, where submarines were lost on the bottom, a new technology, and they had to build a rescue chamber like that to attempt to do that. It was here, you're in a lot of them. I think so. Yeah. Yeah, he talked to the our our, our, our organization. Yeah. Really? Yeah. About about this thing. Wow. Wow, that's incredible. I, um, I wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> I missed that one. I read that. <laughs> uh, but what I want to point to here is Edmund Haley, the English astronomer, also was experimenting with new technology and had five people inside a diving bell at 60 feet for 1.5 hours. 
And now I've got to mention the effect of nitrogen on the human body. Because when you descend to 60 feet, you're under three atmospheres absolute of pressure. So we're all at 15 PSI here. Triple that at 60 feet. It simply means when you take a breath at 60 feet, you're filling your lungs with the same volume of air, but you've got three times the density. So you're soaking up a lot more nitrogen. And if you come up really quickly, after soaking up that nitrogen into your blood, uh, in, you know, not as a gas, but you know, in the blood, it's like releasing the cap on a soda bottle. Nitrogen will bubble out, and you'll get a bubble stuck somewhere in your elbow, in your wrist. That's the bends. Those people had the bends. <laughs> they didn't know about it back then, but they spent too long at 60 feet. They had the bends. This is kind of remarkable. Uh, instead of breathing that compressed air, you could build a one atmosphere barrel, a sealed barrel. So he stays at 15 PSI inside the barrel, the diver, and the barrel is sealed around his wrists with tufts in the 1700s. So he has the entire weight of the ocean trying to push his arms back up inside that barrel. And it's quite restrictive and obviously not very mobile and uh, not very successful. 10 fathoms, 60 feet. Well, let's just shrink the size of the barrel down and plop it right on our heads to make something much more <laughs> efficient and effective. I think what I've read anyway is that the, the early versions of diving helmets really started for work in um, mines and tunnels and also firefighting equipment where you had to have a sealed breathing uh, atmosphere, clean atmosphere, and then evolved into use underwater. But very early on, late 1700s, 1823, Charles Dean's designs, a replica on the left. Um, and obviously, this is just a bucket on your head, so to speak, with a, with a supplied air hose coming down and forcing air into the helmet. It doesn't, doesn't matter how frequently you breathe, air is just coming in, hopefully. So it's not on demand, it's kind of free-flowing, surface supplied. And someone finally gets the idea, because if you fell over in that, you know, you'd lose that bubble pretty quickly. But if you built a suit and sealed and mated the helmet to the suit, you could reduce that risk of losing that air bubble in the helmet. And that's beginning to happen in the 1840s. That will become a standard diving dress for the Navy, which you'll all recognize in the next slide. Oh, well, before that next, I, I just love this image too. This, this is from Parker's book, The History of Commercial Diving. This is a, a scene of salvage in 1854. And you've got a hand cranked compressor uh, there, forcing air down the umbilical to the diver in the seed diving helmet and another uh, diving bell with someone doing some breath hold diving out of it. They're lifting cannons off of this something ship, etc. It's pretty large. Uh, commercial and military incentive for salvaging ships on the bottom, obviously. It's just a wonderful drawing. Uh, you don't see things like that too often because it's a hidden world. It's, it's unseen by most people on land. So there's not an awareness that this was happening. That is the Mark V, a heavy gear that becomes the standard that evolves through the early 1800s. Heavy gear, I mean, heavy lead shoes. This is maybe 200 pounds of equipment in total on a diver. So diving was not for scientists, really. <laughs> not for the lighthearted, really for a kind of big Navy diver guys and salvage guys. The lead harness, the lead belt, the traditional diving knife screwed into the, the bronze sheath. There's a diving museum in Florida, in St. Augustine, Florida. And they've got you know walls of diver's knives and walls of these Mark V helmets. It's, it's a wonderful place to dive. <laughs> stuff. Why does it screw you? So it doesn't fall out. Yeah. And, and then the bronze helmet that's, you know, made it onto the breastplate and the umbilical. And then you have all that on, you really can't even move around much on deck. You have to be lowered by a stage to the bottom of the ocean. Of course, on the bottom, you can control the exhaust. So air is flowing down the umbilical. And by controlling the rate on the exhaust valve, you can fill your suit up a little more or less and control your buoyancy and hop around. But if you rip that suit, uh, particularly before there were the one-way check valves, if you punctured that suit and the weight of the water rushes in, 
there were stories told, and I, they may be apocryphal, but they said, you know, some divers, sponge divers, urchin divers, if they had accidents like that underwater, or the umbilical got cut anywhere between the diver and the surface, the weight of the ocean is pushing the whole diver into that helmet, and they would just bury the helmet. Even try to. Now, I don't know if that's true, and it's a bit grisly. Let's move on. At the same time that that surface supplied uh, system is being perfected, scuba is coming about. Now, scuba is a little different. You can see umbilicals here on the left in this mid 19th century drawing of Roque Roll's um, early scuba. By scuba, we simply mean self contained underwater breathing apparatus. It's not true that scuba means some come up barely alive. It means self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And uh, if the umbilical had to be shut off, they have a reservoir, maybe 250 PSI in a brass tank on their shoulders. That's the self-contained part. But you can see there's no neoprene diving dress. There are no dry suits. This is just wool. They're wrapping divers up in sandals and wool, greasing them down with petroleum oils and and maybe putting a red beanie on their head. There's a tradition of the red divers woolen beanie to try to stay warm because the ocean will drag their, take their heat away at 25 times the rate that we lose heat in atmosphere. And something that people don't always know is when Jules Verne wrote his book, he took his designs for his fanciful 20,000 leagues beneath the sea from what was current of the, in the day for commercial diving outfits. There was nothing made up, no, no kind of science fiction. Those, those outfits existed, that gear did. I mentioned um, the bends before. This was not just a diver's malady. This was called Caisson's disease in the early days because the people who were suffering from this saturation of nitrogen in their blood, turning into bubbles, coming up too fast, were bridge builders and tunnel workers because they would go down and seal caissons, pressurize to keep the water out, do work at depth, under pressure, climb the ladder up, go through an airlock, and presto, without any deep compression, they're back at 15 PSI. They were suffering all kinds of crippling pains and disease, caisson's disease. We only begin to figure that out in the early 1900s. One way to deal with that emergence of the nitrogen bubbles in your bloodstream is to put you back under pressure, to recompress you. So even in the 19th century, they had recompression chambers, treatment chambers. They probably weren't all this plush or had Victorian uh, patients in them dressed to the nines, but to, they recompressed people, put them back under pressure, squeeze those bubbles back down that got lodged in their, in their elbows, in their wrists, um, and hopefully they'd recover and have no long-term lasting effects. If a bubble gets lodged somewhere in your brain, that's a whole different level of impact from Kaysan's disease or the vents. We have the same technology today, of course. This is on the NOAA ship, Helikai. This is a relatively small, uh, multiple place recompression chamber with an airlock to go in the front part and you know compress the uh, medical technician or patient in, open the inner part and take them back down to 60 feet of pressure for most treatments, maybe deeper for some uh, more extreme treatments and then bring them slowly, slowly back up to the surface. Now, something else that's going on too. Now we mentioned surface supplied, we mentioned the early scuba. I'm gonna talk about closed circuit rebreathers. And this didn't really come from the commercial world, I think, or the science world, certainly. This was a military innovation in the early days. At the same time that people are refining scuba, which is an open circuit system. And by that, I mean, you have a scuba tank on your back, Take a breath of air, you blow your bubbles, they fritter away, make noise, and when your air is low, you come to the surface. Rebreathers, take, you take a breath from the small tank on a rebreather, breathe it out, it goes back into the breathing loop. And you add a little bit more oxygen because you metabolize a little oxygen, and you breathe it again. You're rebreathing. There are no bubbles, they're silent, this is why the military is interested in them. Frogmen on rebreathers, no trace. The dangerous part about this and why it wasn't, you know, for everyone at the time is they're using pure oxygen. So I mentioned nitrogen. I'll, have, I'll make a couple remarks about oxygen. Oxygen is a flammable, dangerous gas. Avoid it at all costs. Not really. 
we just need a pretty narrow range of oxygen to survive. You know, too little, we get drowsy. Too much, we go into oxygen toxicity and we can have convulsions. Normally at sea level pressure, we don't really think about it. But when you start breathing oxygen under pressure, when you're now breathing two or three or four times the density of our atmospheric air, our normal pressure, that's a lot of oxygen. So the limits to these pure oxygen rebreathers were six meters. They discovered through trial and error, about six meters is it. Shallow systems. Definitely not for everyone. But scuba was for everyone and became for everyone. And because a lot of kids like me and everyone else, we were watching uh, Jacques Cousteau in the 60s, the underwater world, big influence on all of us, all marine scientists everywhere, right? And the other show that I, I couldn't stop watching was Sea Hunt with Lloyd Bridges as Mike Nelson, because I was pretty sure as a 10 year old kid that I would be required to have hand to hand combat underwater on a weekly basis. <laughs> and that was really exciting to me. And man, I tell you, when I got to the dive shop and took my lessons, I looked at the dive knives, I said, you better give me the biggest dive knife you have. Because, you know, clearly that's that's the way to go. So a long time I had this ridiculous broadsword sized dive knife on my leg. <laughs> Anyway. He always cut the exhaust. Too. Oh, yeah, yeah. He had, had some techniques I thought were pretty smart. You cut their exhaust hose, or you pull their mask off, and they can't see you. That was, that was pretty clever. But he did a lot. He learned to dive for the series, and then he did a lot to promote commercial dive, I mean, recreational dive. He was a real advocate for a long time. Go bridges. And of course, Gusteau, what can you say? So, yeah, school before the masses begins to evolve then. I mean, really in the 50s, People were building their own dive gear. There just wasn't a range available for, for the public. So you, people were making their own dive goggles and masks for a while before things really come on the market. But it's pretty simple at the beginning. It's a tank, some way to kind of strap it on your back and a regulator right at the valve on the tank itself and a, a hose. So you breathe in on one side, breathe out, and the bubbles come out behind you so you don't have to hit you in the face. That's all you need. You don't need any more fancy gear. The gear becomes more and more fancy and actually more and more bulky over time. I think, personally, yes, I'm not being too negative here, that the dive equipment industry, and diving is a self-regulated industry, right? Just saw, like, the more gear we can tell you you actually need, the more you'll have to buy from us <laughs> over time. Anyway, scuba, compared to the heavy gear, the heavy Mark V, obviously for the masses, the freedom of being uh, neutrally buoyant underwater, the simplicity of you know uh, single hose regulators uh, and, and dive computers to track the length of time you stay underwater and your depth. Because remember the effect of gases on your body. We're not going to be able to stay very deep very long. But if you go deep and come up a little and stay there, then you can stay a little longer. And rather than having to track that all in your head with the tables, which we all learned <laughs> from our, our early dive classes, you have a dive computer on your wrist that tells you what your decompression status is and when it's time to begin to return to the surface. You can tell in this picture, as a, as a 10 year old, I thought that you know, diving was really going to be not only an exciting pursuit, but physically build me up to be kind of a massive early <laughs> Uh, kid that I wasn't, obviously, <laughs> at that point. And uh, so I, I had to learn to dive. And at that point, you know, even back then, buoyancy compensators were optional. So this BC, this vest you see on the right, on the right, this, that's a horse collar. That's because we're wearing big neoprene suits, which are closed cell neoprene suits for warmth. But if you go underwater, and those cells, those little cells reduce in size, You've just reduced your displacement. You're now heavier, and you compensate by adding a little air in whatever vest you have. So you maintain neutral buoyancy, or you float at the surface if you have to rest. So buoyancy compensators are good. They weren't always mandatory. But as I say, gear becomes more uh, bigger and more complex all the time. Well, this is the other thing, too. <laughs> <laughs> I will say this, I've been diving now for about 52 years, and it, it really has been a wonderful pursuit. It hasn't been maybe this type of excitement for me, but I'm not saying that fight scenes like this never happened, because as we all know, Thunderball is one of the great diving movies 
that every diver has seen multiple times. And as divers, we're pretty much required to see every diving movie that comes out, good or bad. And so I won't mention them all here, but this was an early one. And that underwater fight scene, the Thunderball, it's a classic. If you haven't seen it, it's highly recommended. And again, this is not a NOAA presentation. I don't represent my agency, and that's not what we do underwater. <laughs> Now, this is also another reason that when I was young, and like I, I knew other, some other divers in the 60s, we all thought that, you know, there was going to be a big future in underwater habitats because we've been watching Jacques Cousteau and we've been seeing, you know, submersibles being built. And things like this were going on, the Sea Lab experiments, the Man in the Sea experiments, where the Navy worked out a lot of the logistics and physiological issues involved in what's called saturation diving. Remember, if you go underwater and you start to soak up nitrogen, it's generally to be avoided. But if you go to, say, 200 feet and stay there for five days, you've soaked up all you're going to soak up. So you're not incurring any more penalty. You can stay there forever. You just have to come up really slowly. So that type of saturation diving was investigated by the Navy, and actually John Craven was the civilian scientist in charge of the Man in the Sea program. He's a wonderful character, and he's quite involved in Hawaii as well. That's it. <laughs> I don't know if this will ever happen, if it'll ever get easier to dive without all that equipment. There's the chair, the pots, thank Hans. And uh, normally we would give you a uh, certificate of appreciation, but I have it on good authority that your wall is full <laughs> of, uh, of meritorious achievements and also Sam's trigger didn't work. <laughs> So thank you very no, much. Sir. You're very welcome. It's a pleasure. Engineers and architects of Hawaii welcome your comments on this program and any of our recent programs. We encourage your direct participation in this community outreach. So please email us your comments and ideas at eahawaii at gmail.com. <laughs>